So let's get started. So welcome. We're now up to lecture 25 out of 28 total of this class, so 545, and today's lecture is on simulation and sim to real. So like this is like a robot simulator, then we'll dive in, we'll scratch the surface of how they work today as they go through a few examples, but So some logistical things, so we are grading homework three, so um, be on the lookout for that. Lab three was due April 12th, so today is April 15th because it's taxes day and when PhD students or admitted PhD students have to decide if they're gonna accept. So I remember April 15th for sure. But it was due April 12th, but if your group has late days, you can use it. Um, Just make sure that everyone on the team has the late day budget. Um, we, we are keeping track of that. So um, please don't make a um investigate your 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 team late day further. Yeah. Yeah, lab four has been released and homework four has been released. So those will be due April 26th. So that's at the end of next week. Um and then yeah, just if you have like quick questions that we can clarify on Piazza, we're happy to answer. Um Otherwise, for more detail, come to one of our office hours and then we'll, we'll try to help you out. And then final exam on May 1st, the time slot should be 4.30 to 6.30. Um, you can use two cheat sheets, so use the one from the midterm and then make another one for the final because it's fully cumulative. And you know, again, I mentioned last time, if you threw away your old cheat sheet, make a new one. All right, question? Um, the final exam will be pretty similar to the midterm um, in like a similar format, except, except it'll just cover most of the second, mostly the second half of the course. But you know, robotics is cumulative, so you, you can't just throw away the stuff from the first half. Um, yeah. And then yeah, for next week, I'll try to have some more like example questions. So um, hopefully that will be helpful. Uh, and by the way, I, I, in case more people start to, to attend because, you know, final exam review often means more people attend, then I have the Google Doc open if you still want to type in there uh, for, for questions. So. All right, so, uh, well, for today, we are going to first briefly review what we covered last time, and then I have a few calculations that I can go through because there were some questions last time about like, why did we do something in a certain way? So I, I went through some of the examples and I, I would like to tell you what I learned when I went through them, just so it, it might make it easier for you if you're given like a new example of a simple dynamic model, like how do you derive kinetic energy, potential energy and, and similar quantity. But then later we'll talk more about some of the newer stuff like how do you actually do physics simulation uh, than simulators that are currently used today? So again, uh, last time we talked about you know the motivation of why we're studying dynamics. So if we know the dynamics of some manipulator or more generally a robot, then we can simulate, analyze, and design algorithms. You know safely without actually using them on a physical system and potentially causing like damage. And we cover things about, you know, how do you compute forces and torques and then the Lagrangian formulation, which characterizes the equation of motion. So the way that, the way that I think of the Lagrangian is just a different way to characterize the equation of motion compared to if we were using a more direct Newtonian physics approach by trying to calculate all the fourth vectors and then computing equations of motion from that. So there's like two different ways to do equations of motion. This is one of them. I mean, that's personally the way I think of it. Um, and yeah, last time we also talked about generalized coordinates. So again, the, the, the term generalized is just like, it, there's nothing fancy about it. Just, it's just a very, a way of trying to cover many different possible cases. 
So you can have a system where your generalized coordinates are just like Cartesian coordinates, but you can also have a physical robot system where the generalized coordinates are the joint angles of the robot. So the only thing that you really need in a generalized coordinate is a set of numbers that characterizes the system. That's it, like a configuration, basically. We also talked about Lagrange equation. So we talked about if you have T here, so T is what? The kinetic energy. And then you have B, um, um, sometimes people use U, um, just double check the reference of whatever you're using. You have potential energy and L equals T minus B. That's essentially the, the way, the definition of the Lagrangian in this context. So I think for this class, the easiest way to view this is just view this as given. You can technically derive these equations in mechanics books and courses, but we're just, we're not going to do that. We're just going to assume that, you know, we're just given this, and then we'll do analysis on that. Yeah. I, I think that's going to make it simpler for, for us. Yeah, and then you have something like this, though. So again, think of the, the dot here is derivative with respect to time, and Think of, think of all the generalized coordinates as functions of time. So they really have a parenthesis t, but we often don't put that in there just to make the equation more manageable. Yeah. And now I also want to clarify that there's some differences in the way that you know people write this. So I put on the course website references to two sources. Um, there was Russ Tedrake's online textbook, which hopefully many of you have at least looked at. And then there's also Modern Robotics, which is another online textbook. So, you know, I mean, you know, these days it's not like the 80s where people wrote textbooks and then you had to buy them. You can, you can find them online, uh, e even the in, illegally in some cases, but these are legal online sources. So, um, so if you just look at the, the website for this, you'll see, you know, Russ Tedrick's notation, which is like this. And then you have modern robotics notation, or it's like Kevin Lynch and, and Frank Park are other leaders in robotics. And they they sometimes write it like this, where if, if there's no subscript on the Q, then that means it's a vector. So you have to think of the Q as being of the vector of all the generalized coordinates. And so when you put in the, like the dot, it's really meant to be a vector of all those derivatives. Uh, and they write the energy like this, which I, mean, I find this to be more intuitive because it's like kinetic and K and then the potential and P. Um, yeah. But uh, a lot of people use the T and U notation. So. Yeah. And again, if the, if the term generalized is annoying, then if you're thinking of just a robotic manipulator system, think of generalized coordinate as the joint angle of the robot. Yeah. Hi. So maybe something a little bit new that builds upon last time. So last time we talked about kinetic energy, and then we went through a couple of simple examples. So I think most, if not all of you, are familiar with the kinetic energy of a point mass that moves in space. So if you have a point mass with the mass m, then the kinetic energy is just like one half m times the velocity squared. And if you're in three D, you just make the just make the v be the uh, the Euclidean norm, and then you square that, and you get basically this thing here, like the velocities in the x direction, y direction, and z direction. So, so this is the general vector formula of, you know, this, we call it like the translational kinetic energy of something that's moving. But in general, the object will also be rotating. So if you have an object like a disk, that's staying in place, but it rotates, then B 
because kinetic energy, the energy as a result of the motion, then it's still moving, but it's not translating. So that's why people, you know, physicists have developed way to compute kinetic energy for rotating body. And that involved what, what's called a moment of inertia value. I mean, maybe most of you are familiar with like mo moment of inertia. So that it's it, the, it, the, the value we, uh, the really annoying thing is we often put an I and then, but it, we also use the identity matrix or the impulse So, but maybe not the impulse, but definitely the identity matrix. So just them, if, if you see something like this, if it's T equals this thing plus one half omega times I times W, then this I means the, in, the inertia thing, uh, not the identity matrix. So, And um, hopefully some of you have seen this formula in, in maybe in some context. Uh, maybe, I, I, don't, I don't know what the, I don't know. So I'm assuming some of you have, so. And the, all right, so what is the omega? So the omega is this angular velocity vector. So describe like how much it's moving around some kind of axis. And if we're dealing with just a rotation in one, about one axis, which means think of like a 2D plane and then something is rotating flat on the plane, then the angular velocity, you can think of it as just, it's a scalar and then you, the, it's the change in the angle. So if you write theta at the angle, it's like theta dot. And then that's, that's the same thing as, as omega here. And then the, the I turns into a scalar. So. Yeah, uh, any, any questions on this? Or maybe this is just review for most of you. Um, I just want to make sure that we go through it in case you know, some people haven't seen this, or maybe they forgot about it before. All right, then uh, let's move on. Oh, yeah. All right, so I think, I think what you're asking is like, what is the form of omega specific? Like, what did, what did, where, where do you rotate about it and what's the magnitude or like how much is rotating? Like, so the way I, 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 so I, I think, and you can double check me if I'm wrong about this, but I, I think what you have is you have omega, which is some vector, then you're just rotating about it, about that thing. But if you, if you're considering rotation in among all the three axes, then you have to have, you have like three numbers in there that indicate like how much you're rotating about each uh, axis direction. And my intuition is like the, the larger the omega value or the larger in magnitude, the more you're rotating. Yeah, that's, yeah. All right, so if you're given this formula, you, you might ask, how do you find the inertia? So I think the short answer is in this class, if we ask you to do that, we're going to give you what the inertia means. So in fact, I think I think that's the case even for many mechanics classes. They they tell you here's a list of well, they might refer you to this Wikipedia, then they say, here's a list of different inertia values. Just assume that if we give you a bunch of links that are that match one of the description, you can use that. Um, so um, hopefully some of you have seen this page on the, what are the, the moment of inertia? Uh, I hadn't seen this before, by the way. So it's like an interesting for me to, to see that uh, last weekend too. So how much kinetic energy in a rotating disc? So that would be a, a disc and then it's just rotating about the, the V axis. So that's why we have I V here for the, um, in the v direction. And then you would just take the formula like one half m times radius squared. And if you're talking about kinetic kinetic energy in a rotating rod, then assuming the axis 
is like this. That's where the axis of rotation is. And that's important though. It, it matters where your axis of rotation is. But if you have something, um, something like that, then you would just make it one half M times L squared. And if you're rotating near the end point of the rod, then that thing at that constant changes. Yeah. I mean, my intuition, my intuition is, you know, when you're rotating at a different near the end, like you can, a little bit of rotation might make the whole thing move a little more. So again, like if, if we ask you to do some computation, then I'll just give you the moment of inertia value. So no, you don't have to put it in your T sheet. All right. Last class, we talked about this double pendulum dynamic. And then we, we went through some of the, cal the calculation, but it also takes about you know, six pages of, of math of handwritten math so uh, we didn't go through everything so um hopefully some of you went through then did some of the math and then if you maybe some of the, the tips that i gave last time about how to do some of the derivative maybe that that helped yeah but i had a question so the question i had last class was how do you like how do you get this t like how do you even start with this thing So my interpretation of this example is because we have this, this double pendulum and the link have no mass. So if we assume they have no mass and the only mass is in M1 and M2, if, if that's where all the mass is, and if we assume that you know those masses, they don't actually rotate, but they, they just you know, translate in 3D space, then we only have the, the translation part of the kinetic energy. And we have we have two masses, so we have the kinetic kinetic energy, we would sum up everything, every body that's in the system, and then we uh, we use that this formula. And the way to get velocity is you know, velocity of the time derivative of derivative with respect to time of the position, and we just like this P1 and P2 are the positions of M1 and M2. So you just apply different of the derivative with respect to T for both, for, for all the components in the vector, and then you get your P1 dot and P2 dot. And then this is basically all you need for your kinetic energy computation. So I, I hope that answered the question that I had last time. Um, I, I think the person who asked the question isn't is here, but um, hopefully the um, yeah, hopefully it, it clear. Hopefully some of you also had this question. I I, I did it too. So yeah, uh, is everyone good on this calculation? I mean, do you want me to go through some of this more, or maybe we just let you do it, and then if you run into a mistake, just show your math, and then maybe I can take a look at it. Okay. All right. So, and then this time I'll go through this in more detail just because I have the note with me and then I just want to show you how to do it. So this is another example with the carpool dynamic. And whenever you, whenever you look at the like double pendulum and carpool, you, you really, it's very important to look at the assumption of what they're making. So here we're assuming, assuming that there's only direction in the X direction, basically. So that, that would be this way. So we have this cart with mass MC. And then we have this, which has mass MP. And the link has what mass? Zero, yeah, zero. If it had math, we would probably tell you that. Or, yeah, we would assume. Oh wait. Oh, this should be assuming the rod is mathless. Sorry. Uh, yeah. This is. Yeah, this should be a rod. Yeah. Uh, 
So when we have this, we, we have only translation of the card. So the card is moving in just a translation way. And then the actual math, the, the thing that I think is somewhat tricky is even though the, the, the math itself, it looks like it's rotating in some sense, the, the actual um, movement is just a, a velocity vector in 3D space. So you're just moving the, you're just the, translating that, this circle thing in, in 3D space. So when you do the kinetic energy computation, it, it's the same formula as, as this slide here. Um, except the annoying thing is the, the textbook uses X now instead of P. So otherwise it's exactly the same as before. All right, so uh, let, let's go through the kinetic energy computation of this. So I have to find where are my six pages I have it. Or seven, I, I forgot about this. There's a new one I had to make today. Ah, this one. Which, which one do you prefer? Like this one? Yeah. I mean, let, let, let's put the uh, time derivative over here. And... What goes over here? X, X1 dot. And this X is the, the, the X1 here refers to that, that bold face X. So when we write that, we're gonna write it like this or this to be the um the one in italic. So what goes here? Oh, that's not zero. Like that. You can see it from back there, right? Okay. All right, and then over here. Did that thing right? Although uh, sometimes it's easier if you just pull out the uh, the constant, like um, if you pull that out here, but this is, yeah. All right, so if we have that, then the kinetic energy computation is pretty straightforward. Um, I'll just do it over here. Where did I make a mistake? Right? All right, so let's just do this. Well, this one didn't get it, right? You just do. Like this is x one dot, so it just has the what do you call it? Like the italic x dot, and then you just square that. So oh. now this thing.
And when you do that, you get this thing has a sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta, so you can get rid of something here. And yeah, this, this is more which I've been emphasizing computing x2 dot times x2 dot. And then if you simplify this, So you get the first get the first term by moving this part over here, and then for this, you have the one half and the two goes goes over eight to get and we see the x So you can see it gets easier to plug quickly if you had more complicated systems. But for simple system like the one you see on our phones and whatever, you can do these types of computations. And one thing that I personally found helpful is like when you do this, like put the the cosine and sine like all at the end of whenever they're like in product. So I find it easier to think about when I can like distribute these terms, or and then when I can get like cosine for data plus sine for data, and then some terms in there. And I hope, hope that. All right, uh, any other questions? So this is from the, yeah, Dre from the, the textbook. Uh, yeah, question? Yeah, I just wanted to know, potential energy for MC, that would be zero, right? In this case, that's why it's not included there. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, though the potential energy is, it should only be from the, the, the mass that, at the pole at the end. So it's assuming that the, this thing is gonna block anything that makes that cart Pole itself go down, but the pole can go down. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. Other question? All right. Hi. So this is a variant. You okay? Yeah, this is a variant of the double pendulum where now the the rods are not massless because I mean come on in real life are they massless? Okay, then so in this case, this, this is the variant where so now there there considered to be no mass near the like the where they the links go together. Like if you if you look at this thing where, where the links connect. There is now considered to be no mass there. All the mass is in the links themselves. And the mass and the mass is and the other assumption we have to make is that the mass is evenly distributed throughout the link. Uh, because if it's not, then you know the model, you have to make some, do some other calculation. But let's just assume that the links have the same length, the same mass, the, just to make the calculation easier. And then the question is, how do you compute the equation of motion for that? What that means is the compute the equation of motion means you compute the kinetic energy, potential energy, form the Lagrangian, and then you take a bunch of derivatives, and then you, you get your equation of motion. So for this example, we're only going to worry about the Lagrangian computation because I feel like once you get your yeah, once you get the Lagrangian, then you, you mechanically compute derivative, then it becomes very mechanical. But some of the thinking part happens in terms of how do you actually write out this formula. So I took this example from here, but you can find other examples and many other variants of the double pendulum. Yeah. 
a system. All right. So the way to analyze this is we, we are still using, in terms of, I guess, generalized coordinates, we, we still have theta one and theta two as the generalized coordinates. But now what we, now when we're characterizing the kinematics of the system, we're going to consider the center of masses of each one, not the endpoint, because the, the center of mass is where the, it's, I guess near the center where the, the mass is distributed. So. And in this case, the, uh, so because, you know, the, like the first link is bolted up, uh, I guess the first link is, you know, like kind of stuck in something by the, the top thing there. So it can only rotate. So that's why we, but it, it well, technically, you can also consider there to be translational velocity because you know, you're considering the um, yeah, the center of this link, but there will be some now rotational kinetic energy to consider here. All right, so the center of masses of the two pendulums is x1 and y1 for the first one, and then x2 and y2 for the second one. So that that's just that mostly an exercise an, an exercise in trigonometry. So I, I think most of you will be able to do that if you have enough time. So we we won't need to do the computation now. But let's look at the kinetic and the potential energy. So potential energy is sometimes easier to compute. It, it's usually the um the math time what time gravity, which is nine point. Eight one something um, times the height, like that would be. I guess in that case it would be the yeah the y one plus y two because you would have to you add you add up the potential energy for each of the separate things um kind of like you do for the kinetic energy. So uh, now let's look at this kinetic energy. What the first term is showing is your standard, you know, one half times mass times velocity squared. So we're moving in two dimensions, and then you have the uh, the velocity vectors. The magnitude of the velocity vector squared is going to be the x one dot squared plus y one dot squared, and then do the same thing for x2 dot and x uh, y2 dot. Right. And this other term here, that's the same thing as what we covered earlier with, with this thing here. We had one half times omega times the i, which is the identity matrix. No, it's not. Inertia, right? Okay. So time the time the omega again. So in this case, like all the rotation is like in, in one axis. So you can think of it as it's just in a 2D plane. So there's only one way of one, uh, one axis around which it's rotating. And so that's why these are all scalar. They then get one half time the, that inertia value time theta one dot squared, which is not the same as theta one dot transpose time Theta one dot. You do the same thing for this thing, and those characterize like how quickly there's the uh, rotation. So, and if, if you want to do more of the detailed calculation, then this this page has this page has more of that. All right. So, hopefully that's clear. So. It's just another example then, and then at least I like this example because it actually shows how to do something with the, you know, the moment of inertia. So my general recipe is I look at the different parts that make the system and the kinetic and potential energy are like the sum 
of the respective term for each of for each of the component. Add that for each of the component, you check if they're if they're translational kinetic energy, and then if they're rotational kinetic energy. So all right. So last time we also talked about the manipulator equation. So again, I, I'm showing this again to try to contrast the notation between this and the modern robotics. So like the two free, legally free online textbook where you can find these sources. So the way that Russ Tedrick writes it is as something like this, where you have like the math matrix times the acceleration plus this term, which has like all the Coriolis forces equal the gravitational forces plus whatever the, the U is, like the actual input that like maybe you have some algorithm that gives you the U, then you have to map it into whatever generalized forces that you have. So, so if you want to look, if you want to to study more about this equation, just look at this reference here. But some people will write it in a little different way. So you have this, and then you have the modern robotics textbook, and they actually write it like this. So it's a little bit simpler, but they also put the they put the gravity in in here, and then they also use the the tau, which it it. Like the tau here was gravitational forces. Here, the gravity is put in in the H term, and then the tau is something separate, which are the joint forces in torque. So, but there's still a mass matrix, um, except now we have theta as the joint angle. So theta and q are two common choices. So whenever you see them, then just think of them as you know the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think my so I can only explain some you no know, some intuition. So my intuition, well, well, well the first thing is the I guess the, the more formal definition is some matrix that maps your acceleration, which is in the the generalized coordinate into some component of the generalized forces. So there's like a matrix that maps from one phase to another, which is the normal definition of a matrix. But I don't know if that actually helps with the intuition. I think you just think of this as specifying like how much the different components of a system like interact with each other. So that's why we have matrices for larger robot systems. So earlier we were only talking about, like we were talking about much simpler system before where you had masses like M like that. And because it was a very simple system without much interaction, then you could write out your masses just as a single number. But if you have like multiple joints that are like I guess more intertwined with each other, then there might be extra terms that you have to account for when you reason about that uh, that kinetic energy. So I don't, I personally don't have very much intuition on this. The main reason is when 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 you're dealing with these equations, someone will just give you the mass matrix. Like you're not gonna derive it yourself unless it's the most trivial cases. So I don't know if that how much that actually helped, but just think of it as you know. You're, someone who designed the robot is going to give it to you. Uh, it's the same thing with. I mean, no, this is a this is a formalism. So the way of characterizing how do robots move in general, and then the idea is, for any new robot system, take the specific values of the matrices, and then you define them, and then your simulator should work.
Oh yeah. So the manipulator equation, they help to characterize the equations of motion. But there's also two different ways that you can view that type of that, that type of equation with terms that are called you know forward and inverse dynamic. Uh, you know, not, not to be confused with forward or inverse kinematic. Which well, I guess they're very closely related to each other. So yeah. Yeah. So we have inverse dynamics, which would be this equation. So just, you can think of this as like finding the joint forces and torque that are course that correspond to a robot state and a desired acceleration. So you have your the robot state is gonna be theta plus theta dot plus theta double dot. And then you do the computation, you find you find the tau. And the use case is you design a controller to make the robot follow some kind of trajectory that you know you calculate the torque necessary to move the robot joint. So I think the subtle distinction with like inverse kinematics is inverse kinematics, you find the joint angle that result in some end effector position. Here it's like you find the the torque necessary to move the robot joint to some trajectory. So, so I guess like finding the torque versus finding the, the joint. So it's very closely related, but I, I guess that's the, the subtle difference between the two. And then you have the forward dynamic, which all you do is you basically, you, you solve for theta double dot. And you have the math made the inverse of the math matrix. What would happen? What, ha what happens if the math matrix is not invertible? So it, it, it can't be invertible. It can't be, it, it has to have an inverse. So if you remember the, the the math made the kinetic energy was one half times the the joint angle times the math times the, the joint angle again. So the, the kinetic energy cannot be negative. So it's a positive semi-definite matrix. So there's an inverse that exists. So yeah. So you can you can you can do this computation. And here is about you determine the robot acceleration, which is the theta double dot, given the state and the joint forces and torques. And you're aware that like, if you have, so you might, so if you're thinking, you know, you, you're getting the acceleration, but you really want the change in the velocity, then just, you, you, you can integrate with respect to time, and then you get velocity, and then you integrate it again, you get position. Yeah, because the integration is the reverse of differentiation, um, you know, very, yeah, roughly so. And the use case is how do you simulate the robot? So if you are sort of like inputting the theta here, then how will the, like, what will the acceleration be? All right, so, so I think we will be mostly interested in the four dynamics because it helps to build simulators, which are a very helpful piece of the robotic toolkit. So in, in order to run simulators, the key thing that has to be done is to go from like a continuous function, you have some, you know, differential equation that describe the equation of motion for the robot. It's a function of T, but you, to simulate it in a computer, you have to discretize it. So you have to have like some time step where you have the robot state, the velocity, the acceleration, 
and then you change the time step a little bit, and then you get your next you know, robot state, velocities, and so on. How big do you make the step size? It's a very deep question. It, it's, um... what, what happened if what happened if you what happened if you make the step size really small? Like what do you what do you think will happen? Yeah, larger computation time. Yeah, basically. So why do it? So yeah, when when you're when you're doing the step, you'll often get better accuracy with the smaller step size. Yeah. Well, that's why when you're working with simulators, at least the ones that I've worked with before, many very often there is some configuration file like a YAML file. Then you have a DT somewhere like the delta t, and then you can write something there like one over sixty or. I mean, 60 because you no, know, many simulators have or try to make it like real time. So if you make it like 60, you get like 60 is a nice number because that's the number of like seconds in a minute and, and so on. So in order to, to do the dynamics for simulation, there are different methods for doing that. Now, some of the most basic methods are Forward Euler, so forward Euler is an explicit method for trying to go from the equation of motion to something that you can implement on a computer. So forward Euler is very bad. I mean, nobody uses it in practice, but we cover it because it's the easiest thing to understand first. And also to know like what, what makes it bad and how to fix it. Backward Euler is a little bit better. I mean, you get I mean, backward Euler is like the main difference is. I guess maybe we should go back and look at the notation a, a little bit. So, in this notation, the t indicates some time step, and f you can think of f as being like that Lagrangian that we computed. So f is something that characterizes the equation of motion, and then you make it equal to y dot. So this is meant to be very general. So I'm, I'm trying not to make it too tied to a specific system. So when you look at, when you study these methods, you'll, you'll see the notation because it's the most general and try to encompass many different robot systems. So you have like y dot is equal to f t of y. Now forward Euler will you have some iteration n, that's in simulation. You run it for like n equals some number of steps, like 10 million, 100 million, or whatever. Your sort of next time step, if you want to think of this as your position of the robot, that's, or joint angle of the robot, that you can think of that as being your, your yn plus one. So I put, like, I put something like that over here. But using this notation is like the more general way, and the one that you'll see when you when you look up how these methods work. So you have y n plus one equals y n, which is the prior value, plus some step size times this thing, which is that time derivative. Now backward Euler, you you get this. And the only difference is instead of having Tn and Yn, you get T and plus one and Yn plus one. So this is called implicit because the, the thing that you're trying to compute appears on both sides. So you need to have a system of equation to solve. So it looks a little more complicated. So it must have some kind of benefit over the forward Euler, you know, otherwise people wouldn't use it. I mean, in practice, if you look up 
different documentation on simulator, they, they will do things like the runge cutoff method. So if you heard of that before, it's nice to know. If not, then just look up this thing over here. And if you look at different you know, simulators and their specs, they'll, they'll often mention they run something like runge cutoff. All right, so any any questions on this? Like we'll, we'll go through an example of forward and backward order in a second, so. Actually, uh, before that, I think it's a good time to take a break. It's roughly halfway, so maybe in about five minutes, we'll return and then we'll do an example of forward oiler and backward oiler a bit. All right. So we'll be back at maybe 4.56.
All right, so let's get started again. So, so yeah, I um, hope you had a good break. And I think before we move on to discussing some more of the simulators, I thought we would at least go through an example of the calculation for a forward and a backward Euler just to get a sense of like why the forward Euler is, even though it's a very simple method, it's almost rarely used in practice, in, in real simulators. And so the example that we'll use is based on the simple, you know, first order differential equation. So like it's, no, we're not worrying about like a Lagrangian right now, just a, a simple a differential equation that we can get. So I think many of you are familiar with like this differential equation. So if you took a differential equation class, you you must have studied something like, you know, y dot equals a y that describes the evolution of the system. And then if you have an initial value, then your like the function that characterizes the system is equal to this initial thing times the exponential of a times t. Did that look familiar? Yeah, I can go through the calculations if you want, but um, I'm just going to assume that it, something like that is okay. Now, all right. So if we have this function and a is greater than zero, then if you look at what happens in the system, because we have the negative there, it's going to cause the, the function to collapse to zero. So there's going to be some decay. So this is like some true function that we want to see. So we're going to approximate this function with Euler with the uh, forward Euler and backward Euler. So if you do the forward Euler, uh, basically if you, you just do the formula, get So you have h here, and then you have the f, which is your y dot, and then that turns into um, minus a y, and you put in the end, and that's the y value that you have. And then this is just how to rewrite. Now, H is a positive number because of a, it's a step size parameter. So it's like some small value, like in a one over 60 is a common one, like one over 30 and whatever. A, we assume is also a positive thing. So this, this whole thing is going to be less than one. So you can make it between, you can have it between zero and one, but, but if, a or H are large enough, then you can actually make it like very negative, like negative one at some point. And the big problem if you make it, if, if, this, if this thing is like below negative one, you've got a big problem here with instability in the simulation. But let's look at, let's look at what happens if you have this zero. So if you have that, then you know this thing right here. You can think of the way that it will approximate the system is like at the next time step, 
So if you go from, I guess, n equals zero to n equals one, the way that this integration will work is you will go a little bit in that in the derivative of, of that, right? And then you'll go down a little bit like this. Now the I guess the, the bigger the, the flip side, you know, you might you might make it go a little bit further, uh, further towards zero. So at the next time step, you might go no, down a little bit more. And so the way to the way to think about the the forward Euler is that it'll make approximations based on where the slope is at your given time step. Like this is the first time step, if this is the second time step, look at the slope over here. And then I try to you know take a step assuming the function is assuming you have that that slope. So so at the end of the day, what will happen is you have your some like a set of like discrete curves that try to approximate the smooth curve. And I'm not gonna put it in the numbers. You can look at some examples online, like there's some places where you can like plug in the numbers and you see how close of an approximation you can get to that, that smooth function. So the way that some people try to get around this is use a smaller step size. So if you use a smaller step size, then the, the discrete steps that you get are going to be, I guess, closer to that true smooth one. But there's a problem when you try to make your, your step size large. So if, if you make a mistake, or, or maybe you're, you're deliberately making a mistake and you try to make the step size big enough so that no. that one minus a times h is less than negative one. Then what happens is your next value of y n plus one will be y n will be something that is like y n, but it's, it's negated, so it, it puts it puts below the taxi, but it also it, since it's less than negative one, like the magnitude would be greater. So if this is y zero, then you get negative y zero. So you get negative y zero, but your y one might be somewhere over here. So you might be over here. Now then the next time you do it, you'll be back up over there. And so the, the simulator, the, the this system will uh, diverge. Um, so basically that just means if you use forward will, you have to be really careful about making your your step size small enough. But when you make it small enough so that it takes forever to simulate. Then it's also not a very good, it can be very impractical to use. So, uh, this is just uh, some, at least some intuition that for, for why you, you, you might not be concerned a little bit about the forward width. Now, when you're doing the backward width, We can find out what it's going to give you. Yeah, so the main difference is you now get YM plus one here. Now, when you solve for this, you get uh, this. So the formula is a little bit different. This is like this. No, this thing here is going to characterize the steps of the thing. 
this term here, you have one over one plus some positive number here. So this thing must be, I guess this thing has to be between zero and I guess one. Like if, if this thing is goes to zero, you get one. And then the step size goes large, then this thing approaches zero. So it's always between zero and one. And so the this type of divergent behavior doesn't count. So uh, this is an example or which might give you some intuition about the dangers of the pitfalls of using polar noises, even though it's a simpler. And again, just think of just think of y and plus one as describing like if you want to think about this in terms of robotics like this, just think of this as a 1D robot, and then you have a robot that you're trying to simulate. And then these are the discrete steps that you run the computer to say that the next time step you make this state of the robot equal to that, and you run the simulator again, you increase the value of n. And you know, real simulators will do something like this, but with many more variables. So this is not just one number, but like a long vector. Yeah, uh, feel free to take photos or whatever. You know. I, th I think this is the last map that I have, so it'll be up there in, in case you don't take the photo right away. Um, hi. Simulators in practice, so... So some of the common terms that you might see if you're working with robots and simulators today are, well, some common simulators are Muchoko, there's Bullet, there's Flex and Physics, there's Drake, and, and so on. Like some of these are like, it, it depends on what you mean by the simulator. Like some of them are packaged into other software. Then you might say you run some robotic code that is powered by this simulator. But sometimes people use different terms, but I view these as simulators. So. And the main reason why I mention them is that they're fairly common in the field of machine learning and robotics, where you have to like run the simulator a lot to get a lot of data. And many of these are very are also quite recent. So if you're if you're doing robotics, you know, 20 years ago, people might have you know questioned like why are you working with simulator that you're doing contact rich manipulation task. But today when you know simulators have gotten so good that it's pretty common to see people do test robot manipulation and simulation. Even though that was not a thing you know a couple of decades ago for, for contact rich manipulation. Yeah if you're using like Roth code like you know, if, if you're still using that, then there's gazebo, like that's another simulator that was commonly used. Um, it's just that, you know, gazebo will simulate things like interaction between a gripper and like a, an object, as well as some of the more recent simulators. And yeah, there's a variety of reasons why you would want to use simulators. I mean, some of them are pretty straightforward, so. You can test and debug algorithms, so you don't have to like like your development cycle will be a lot faster than if you're working with a physical robot. It breaks down, then you call the company, they don't respond. You call the company again, they don't respond. Um, happened to me a lot. And then you, you know, you have a contact there, then they finally fix something for you. Uh, but then the paper deadline has passed. Uh, now the nice thing here is that you can do, you can fairly compare different algorithms. Now, why is that? Like if you have two different algorithms for you know robots that walk across some rugged terrain, you run a physical robot once, it walks across it, but then it deforms the terrain a little bit. You have a second robot, but it 
the terrain will have been changed by the first one. And then how do you reset it back? Like you can't really make the real world perfectly physically similar. But in simulation, you can call like reset the environment, use random seed um, 42 or whatever, and then you, you have your um, common environment that you compare the different algorithm on the exact same thing. Hmm. You can also, yeah, I mean, you can get data faster. Um, they, they, I got the caveat that it, you, you might need a lot of data if the if the data is noisier. Oh, oops. So if you're trying to get data for like a machine learning approach to robotics, you know, real world data will be slower to get, but it'll be more accurate because it was collected in the real world instead of simulation, which you can get more of quickly, but it'll be noisier. All right, so yeah, then you can also customize the data distribution. So you're not bound by like the distribution in the real world. Yeah. So if you think about trying to train some kind of autonomous vehicle, then if you're like the main, uh, isn't the main issue with autonomous you know, driving like the corner or edge cases where you have like some new data that you would basically never appeared in training and then it runs into some problem. But if you have a simulator that is high fidelity enough, you can like try to deliberately generate the rarer scenarios more often. Uh, to, to try to, that, that, that's a pretty important thing. Uh, if, if you can actually do it accurately. Uh, you can also like actually do something like you no know, learn some some policy and simulation, and then you transfer it to the real world. So that thing has gotten very common today, especially in you know learning based approaches for robotics. You learn something in simulation, and you if you cover many different diverse scenarios in simulation. The real world is like another variation of that uh, in theory. Yeah. And then other caveats are, you know, simul every simulator will only be approximation and they they do get worse when you have a lot of objects together, which they also get slow. And uh, so I have a lot of experience trying to get deformable to work in simulation or, and, and I, I've seen many cases where like, in a simulator, you put two layers of cloth one on top of each other and then it causes the simulator to explode. I mean, literally, you see like exploding cloth, um, depending on the simulator. Uh, but uh, any questions about this? All right, let's look at some examples. So this is an example of Mujoko. So um, you can look at the, the developer, you know, YouTube channel. So this is one of the developers. So. Uh, Mujoko can simulate things like, like all the particles, and then I think they they click on the humanoid robot there, and then they just move it around. Boom. Oh, oh I guess they're just moving everything over to one spot. Oh, oh yeah, so now they're moving that the humanoid robot in there. And then you can see that there's many different objects together. All of them have some sort of contacts that the simulator has to resolve. So it's a pretty nice demonstration of, yeah, of like adding in many objects together. Another one that I like is this one where you have flutter, uh, fluttering cards. So, I mean, you can think of this in, in terms of like a robotics task, like we want to train a robot to be able to clean up a deck of card. And then maybe the simulator will just generate different scenarios for you. So for some context, the simulator is actively backed by Google DeepMind robotics team, which is pushing simulation very, very much. And before that, it was developed by basically it was I mean, Uval was part of it, but there was another 
professor, like Emmanuel Todorov at the University of Washington, who almost developed the simulator himself. So he, like, he made it closed source, and then Google, Google DeepMind, like, bought his software, and then it, it helps a lot of people in the community by making it free. So, uh, so if you're looking at documentation, just look at if it was, like, pre-DeepMind or post-DeepMind. And uh, one thing that I actually found is when I look at, when I was looking, doing my background research on this, they actually have a, some documentation on how they do the numerical integration. So you'll see like similar terms uh, to what we covered in, in class like earlier today. So that was pretty nice to see. Oh yeah, so another simulator is Bullet. So Bullet is, Another simulator, um, also kind of by one person, Erwin Kuhlman, who used to work at Google. And so it's no longer actively maintained, but it was used in a lot of papers for robot manipulation, especially for things like testing, you know, can robots, can a robot manipulator like, you know, grasp, you know, a pile of objects or toss things. And it can also do some deformable. So, you know, there's a great paper by um, this, this author. And here are some like videos that the uh, the great author made. Uh, so, uh, any any questions about that? So another simulator is so Flux and PhysX are two physics backends that are. That, that power thing, like that power Isaac Jim. So Isaac Jim is like a software that the can do like machine learning plus robotic. And the main you know, benefit of Isaac Jim is you can put all data on a GPU. So when you're doing things like reinforcement learning or anything that requires a lot of data, you often have the, the environment data is on the CPU but the deep networks are on the GPU. And so there's a cost in data transfer between the two. So Isaac Jim tried to put everything as much on the GPU as possible to make things run much faster. Uh, my PowerPoint just, oh, oh. ah. I thought it froze, but uh, didn't. So this is an example video that uses reinforcement learning, and then they they create the they use Isaac Jim simulation to populate a bunch of different robots in different scenarios. Each you can think of each of these robots as its own environment, and it's not interacting with other robots, but it's interacting with like the environment, and it's learning how to how to walk. And you can each of like each of these like a separate environment. And then in the GPU, you would have a data tensor of like dimension, first dimension at the batch side, which is gonna be pretty big here, like 4,000 or 9,000 are pretty typical number. That then the rest of the data is like the state information of the robot. So, so that's like the state of the of everything. And then you run that into your algorithm for deep reinforcement learning and then you you learn you you learn from that um, yeah and then they then test on a, on a real robot so okay the, the whole point of all this parallelism is that different robots will experience different things but then you get a lot more diverse data with you know, more robots out there All right, so, so now that we have a simulator, so let's start talking about a technique for trying to use simulation to be able to then get a, something, get a robot to work in the real world without any sort of extra data that you might need. So a very a, a conceptually straightforward technique is called a domain randomization. So um, you, you can kind of see what the name implies, like you have, 
a bunch of things in simulation that you try to randomize. And you train the model to work on all these different properties in simulation. They're often like visual properties or physics properties. Like, you know, you have image, color, and lighting. And then for physics, you have friction and you know, damping and other you know, terms that are involved in physics. And the hope is, if you have your simulator, then it'll have some kind of distribution. So every time you randomize a parameter or a set of parameters, you get like essentially a different simulator because they have, their, they have a different visual and physics property. You get some distribution and then hopefully it covered, the distribution is broad enough that it covers like what the real world would look like. So I think it was first popularized by OpenAI. They had this paper where you can train you, you can train a robot to grasp object by in training and simulation. You just randomize many different things. Like in training, you randomize you know lighting condition, object position, you know different textures, and if you can train that in simulation, you hopefully get a policy that, that works well on that data, then the real world looks like that. I mean, so it's like, like it's mainly about broadening the training data distribution. Right, any, any questions on that? How do you decide how much domain randomization to do? You have to think a lot about that. It's not an easy question. So. And also I found that even when I do domain randomization, sometimes simulators just don't actually support the different properties that I need. Like there might be different values of friction, but if I change, even if I vary friction, it won't actually cover like the real world distribution. Like it'll be the friction that makes the simulator like kind of okay, but then if I, increase it too much, it makes it explode. So it doesn't actually, it might not cover the real world distribution. So that's just another caveat with relying a lot on domain randomization. So yeah, so even but the funny thing is domain randomization has gotten so mainstream that the CEO of NVIDIA had talked about it. So I actually remember, I remember a watching one of his you know, promotional videos, but then he was really gung-ho on domain randomization that he showed some videos of robot and many different changing things and the simulator that they support. And he was saying, you know, look at all this awesome domain randomization. Now, uh, unfortunately, I, I couldn't find that video because if you look on, if you try to find his video, you'll see that he's given tons of talks. So, I can't find the one that I remember him, but I found this, which is a close substitute. Uh, so 620. So, so now there's a, yeah, minimize the thin to real gap, which is often something we say in research papers. So in robotics, no, so in CARB, it's more regular, than the data that you would get that a robot might see in the home. It's much more irregular. Yeah. It's impossible to collect and label all the scenarios. So yeah, and then you, you generate synthetic data and, and then they're gonna show some domain randomization, I, I think. Yeah. The, Yeah, will be supercharged. So, so you see, like when you're, this is like a machine learning for robotics approach where the hypothesis is, you know, if you domain randomize enough, it'll be good enough for the policy. Now, it, it is somewhat conceptually interesting because it doesn't seem like humans actually learn in a domain randomized world. Like that would mean we often like the the sky would be a different color each day, or the building would be a different color each day. Like it, so. There are some like conceptual objection to that some people have to 
all the domain randomization. But it is a very common technique that is pretty standard now. All right, so another thing to real example is when, when OpenAI, you know, at the time, roughly 2018, 2019, they had a robotics team. But then they, they, they disbanded it because robots is hard and making GBT is easier. Uh, so when they had a robotics team, they trained a robot hand to manipulate a Rubik's cube. And they were able to make it robust to many disturbances, like you know, putting a giraffe head in there or covering something with some, some paper. And if you look at their blog post, the they use domain randomization, although they use a special type of domain randomization to try to adapt or to make the, the to actually change the data distribution that was induced by the domain randomization. But you can see what they've done here. Like in simulation, they changed a lot of the different colors and the lighting of you know, the robot hand. And with all that, you know, they were able to, they trained a lot in simulation using reinforcement learning. And with enough compute, you can get, I think they reported 20% success rate in the real world. So any questions on that? So here's another one that I like a lot. So this example is from Xiaolong Wang Group at UC San Diego. They do a lot of dexterous manipulation, learning from simulation, and then transferring it to real. And the simulator they use is Isaac Jim, which is what we covered earlier with like, it's backed by the physics and the flex simulators. So I think they use physics here because the flex is more for deformable. And the objective of this paper is just use tactile sensing to try to rotate an object. So they have like some, some Z axis and just rotate the object. Uh, it's like, like what, a, what a human can do, but with this type of hand, like the illegal hand, that's the name of it. And uh, then, yeah, so how did we achieve this? And uh, then you see that they have a set of artificial objects in either gym. You have this hand, and then you just put in a lot of the data, randomize it enough, and then you, you know, make it work in the real world. Uh, you don't have to know all the details of this. I just want to give you the high level idea of like how simulation might work. And then they get results that are like this, where you have the cube but then you can just rotate it. Um, yeah, the other thing that was helpful was using tactile sensors. And when you use coarse tactile sensors that just give you like binary, you know, yes, it's in contact, no, it's not, then it actually makes it easier to simulate or to minimize the sim to real gap. Because in simulation, you can just say, is it in contact or not? In the real world, you can do the same thing. But if you had to do something like, in the real world, you get a high quality image from a sensor on the hand, it's hard to do that in simulation. So that was the key insight of the paper. Yeah, um, that was visual input. All right, another example is with this paper, so there's a different, by a different team at Stanford University, but they also use Isaac Jim and reinforcement learning with a lot of domain randomization that's involved in the training. And then you simulate a lot of things. You have your simulated hand, you use the simulated robot, try to pull out object, and then you I guess you, you assemble the Lego blocks or whatever. And then that's the simulator. The real world looks like that, where the, the video is sped up by four X. So, and then they put it there and then 
they, they have this hard coded forcing thing because the hand is not the fingers are not strong enough to actually press. Like you have to actually use the uh, like the palm. So yeah, so this is another example of what you can do with dexterous manipulation while learning just from a simulator. All right, so to summarize, we covered a little bit about simulators. We covered like a continuation of the dynamics from last class. We talked a little bit about like how to do the simulation steps, like with the forward oiler and the backward oiler, and then talk a little bit about sim to wheel. And then coming up next, we'll talk about some fundamental topics in 3D representation and rotation representation. Um, I'll be making references to my work a lot, so um, just be prepared for that. And then, yeah, next week will be more like final exam reviews and then some interesting topics like, you know, how are people using, you know, chat GBT with robotics, like some interesting advanced topic. But I'll see you on uh, Wednesday then.